Thank you for watching Scary Bear Attacks. If you like this episode, please remember to hit the like button and leave a comment or two. Then subscribe and click on the bell to receive notifications of whenever we release new videos. Also, please remember to share them to your social media. Welcome back to Scary Bear Attacks. Today's episode takes us to a section of the Iditarod Trail near Rainy Pass Lodge in the Alaska Range in the state of Alaska. The Happy River runs through a broad valley and its waters fill pockets of muskeg and small ponds. It is the first major valley just west of Denali National Park and is almost as pristine and wild as it. The famous Iditarod Trail runs through the two mile wide valley as it makes its way from Anchorage to Nome. The mountains here top out right at around 6,000 feet in elevation, with steep peaks giving way to sloping, lush valleys. The animals in this area are quintessential Alaska iconography, with caribou, moose, and doll sheep meandering meadows and gorging on greenery. To balance prey animals, predators like wolves, black bears, and brown bears patrol the prairies. The evergreens here include cedar, spruce, pine, fir, and hemlock with aspen, alder, and poplar trees dropping their leaves each fall, creating a colorful display. Willows, sedges, and grasses cover every space that trees do not, providing food and shelter for its denizens. On the afternoon of Sunday, June 27, 2010, 54-year-old geologist Robert Miller was exploring mineral locations for Mill Rock Exploration. He'd worked as a roofer only five years prior and wasn't afraid of sweating and taking risks. He was armed with a 357 Magnum pistol and was not carrying bear spray. It was a nice day with temperatures reaching into the lower 50s and spattering rain interrupted the mostly clear skies. Spending the better part of the day looking at potential mineral deposits, one of his last remaining tasks was to carve out a helicopter landing spot for his extraction. Packing a small handsaw with him, Robert began falling bushes and dragging them out, creating a small clearing. The helicopter pilot agreed to contact him by radio when he was within five miles of Robert's reported location, so Robert rushed to complete the impromptu landing pad. Over the din of the saw ripping its path through limbs, Robert didn't hear the approach of an angry grizzly bear, if it made any noise at all. He noticed it when it was only a few yards from him, and it wasn't growling or snarling. The bear dashed for Robert and covered the 25 feet separating them in about one second. Robert had just enough time to pull out his 357 Magnum pistol from its holster and fired off a single shot in the bear's direction. He wasn't sure if he'd hit it or not and immediately dropped onto his left side into the fetal position. Robert clasped his arms around his neck to protect it from the bear's claws and teeth. The grizzly wasn't convinced by Robert's acting job and bit onto his right arm repeatedly, puncturing it in several places. He felt the bear's teeth dig into the area around his funny bone at his elbow, but failed to see the humor. The popping of his bones told him that the bear had broken Robert's olecranon process during the 15-second attack. After the bear vented its fury on him, it wandered off into the brush. Robert was relieved at the relent of the bear's attack and pulled himself up to his knees. As soon as he glanced around, Robert spotted the bear only 40 yards from him. At this point, Robert still held his pistol and managed to squeeze off two more shots before diving onto the ground once again. Given he is right-handed and his right arm bore the brunt of the damage during the bear attack, Robert was sure he had missed both shots. Robert dove face first into the dirt and placed his arms around his neck once again. He could feel the overwhelming pressure of the bear's teeth as they ripped through his flesh and bites placed all over his body. With adrenaline dulling the pain, he lay still and played dead as best he could. The bear swatted Robert and chewed on any part of the man's body that would fit in its mouth. After ripping at the man's flesh for several more seconds, the bear once again disappeared. This time Robert didn't move for several minutes, knowing the bear could be nearby watching him. His mind raced as he listened and hoped that the bear had gone for good this time. Unsure of where his pistol had gone and hoping he could find his radio, Robert peered through the corner of his eye, searching for the bear. After hearing nothing for several minutes, Robert tried to lift himself to his knees once again. His body didn't seem to respond to his commands, and he realized he was too severely injured to regain his feet. Searching his breast pocket, Robert found his radio. Holding his radio near his mouth, Robert pressed the button and stuttered, Mayday! Mayday! Hoping for a response. 
Every 20 seconds, he would repeat this call for help, but received no reply. After 20 minutes, a voice crackled over the radio. It was the helicopter pilot who was oblivious of the bear attack on Robert. The pilot was contacting Robert to let him know he was within five miles of the scientist's last reported location, as they had previously planned. Relaying the details of his altercation with the grizzly, Robert watched as the helicopter piloted the craft directly overhead. The helicopter then circled Robert's location in an increasing radius, searching for the bear's location. After determining the bear had fled the scene, the helicopter pilot informed Robert that he would be returning with a medic, and flew off. Ryan Campbell was in the next valley over, and was a wilderness-trained medic. The pilot contacted Campbell, and landed nearby to take him to Robert's location. Campbell was dropped off near Robert, and quickly rendered first aid to the injured man. The sensation of burning and electricity seared through Robert's body as an antiseptic was applied to his wounds just before they were bandaged. Campbell helped load Robert into the helicopter and he was flown to the Rainy Pass Lodge a few miles from the attack site. Lodge owner Steve Perrins helped triage Robert alongside Campbell and that is when the pain began to set in. Organizing a relay flight, Robert was flown to a nearby airstrip where an emergency medical technician was waiting. The medical helicopter was better equipped to render first aid and departed to Providence, Alaska Medical Center in Anchorage while the crew worked to save Robert's life. Robert's left ear was stitched back onto his head and his other injuries were sutured shut after further cleaning. Rick Sinnott, an Alaska Department of Fish and Game biologist, stated that Robert was very lucky to have received the injuries he had, given they could have been much worse. He also relayed the fact that Robert's choice in firearms was inadequate to protect a person from an attacking bear. Sinnott concluded by saying that playing dead likely saved Robert's life. Following Robert's grizzly bear attack, Perrins returned to the area in search of the bear. His party could not find any evidence of the bear being wounded from any of the shots fired from Robert's 357 Magnum. It had clearly left the area and was likely uninjured. There was no indication of cubs being present at the attack site and no action was planned against the bear. Robert expressed no animosity to the bear after his attack. He indicated that the bear was just doing what bears do, and that the incident was unfortunate. After reviewing the facts surrounding this episode, I'm left with a few questions for you. Do you think the bear was just as surprised as Robert at their close-range encounter? Do you think the bear creeped up on him while he was cutting limbs? Would bear spray have prevented this attack? Was this attack defensive or territorial? I'll be glad to read and reply to your thoughts, so please post them in the comments section below, and let's talk about it. Welcome back to Scary Bear Attacks. Today's episode takes us to George Lake, just outside of the small town of Delta Junction, Alaska. The city of Fairbanks is about 90 miles north, and the U.S.-Canada border is only 105 miles east, depending on how far you stretch the measuring tape. The Tanana River system starts just inside the national boundary and winds its way through the Tanana River Valley, where it meets the Delta River. To the north lay the White Mountains, and at their foot rests George Lake. The lake has become a trophy fishing mecca, with abundant northern pike pulled from its icy waters. With a subarctic climate, winters will frequently dip below minus 40 degrees. The majority of precipitation will fall as snow with average accumulations approaching five and a half feet each year. Common plants in this area include black and white spruce, American dwarf birch with aspen trees creating a canopy above wild lingonberry, crowberry, and bog blueberry, yielding their delicious fruits. Roaming the forests here, you'll find moose and wood bison. The predators here include lynx, coyotes, wolves, black bears, and brown bears. On Thursday, June 7, 2013, 64-year-old Robert Weaver and his wife were arriving at their lakeside cabin. Robert was the owner of George Lake Recreation Rentals and was aided in his business by his doting wife, whom we'll call Rita. As they pulled up to the dock in front of the cabin, they could see a black bear very close to it. Tethering the boat to the dock, they began to yell at it in an attempt to drive it off. The brush nearby seemed more inviting, so the bear took shelter there, while keeping an eye on the couple, now making their way ashore. Now burdened by the items they were carrying toward the cabin, Robert and Rita were distracted and seemed to have lost focus on the black bear. As they walked the path toward the cabin, the bear must have circled around to approach them from a hidden location on the side of the trail. 
As Robert walked past the concealed black bear, it leapt out of the bushes and tackled him to the ground. The bear's teeth latched onto Robert's flesh as its claws tore at him. He yelled out for Rita to get to the cabin as the bear straddled him. Rita quickly made her way into the cabin and looked out the window, hoping that Robert would fight the bear off and get inside with her. She realized that she would need to help him, as the bear was overwhelming him with its power and tattering his flesh. Rita searched the coat closet for a hunting rifle that was stored there. Picking it up, she knew she'd have to risk injuring her husband further in order to save his life. She bolted for the door and was soon standing only a few feet from Robert, who was still thrashing in resistance to the bear. Now Robert knew how to handle this rifle, and always took care of anything involving it, but that responsibility now fell to Rita. She was woefully unfamiliar with how to operate the rifle, and managed to partially work around into the chamber before jamming the action, rendering it useless. The rifle jammed at the most critical time of need. She pried at the rifle and tried to dislodge the cartridge, but knew her husband didn't have much time. Reaching a point of frustration, Rita ran back into the cabin and grabbed anything she thought she could throw at the bear. Approaching the angry Bruin, she would throw item after item at the bear, but it focused on her husband, regardless of her actions and screams. While Rita threw things at the bear, it periodically glanced toward her, but stubbornly returned to mauling her husband. She knew that she could do nothing to save his life, and her mind drifted to what the bear would do once Robert was dead. Deciding that after it was finished with her husband, it would come for her, Rita made her way back into the cabin. She blockaded the door with furniture and sheltered inside, hoping the bear would leave her alone, but her hopes would soon prove to be in vain. The black bear approached the front door to the cabin and began prying at the blocked door. It pushed and pulled at any aspect of the door it could work its claws into. The bear wasn't satisfied with having Robert's corpse to eat, as it clearly wanted to kill Rita as well. Rita knew she had to reach out for help, as the bear was not scared of her, no matter what she did. She used her cell phone to dial 911 and begged for immediate help. Alaska State Troopers boarded an R-44 helicopter and tried to land near the cabin, but the terrain was too treacherous. The muskig and dense stands of trees surrounding the cabin forced them to reconsider their rescue plan. Nielsen Air Force Base sent out a rescue team aboard an HH-60 Pavehawk helicopter, which was equipped with a hoist. As the helicopter hovered, a black bear busted from brush and menaced the men emerging from it. A warning shot sent the black bear into the nearby brush, allowing them to proceed with their mission. The helicopter dropped a team of rescuers nearby the cabin as an additional patrol officer was brought in by boat. They made their way to the cabin by 9 p.m. to rescue Rita and recover Robert's body. With all of the din from the helicopter and the airboat, the bear had been driven off of Robert's corpse. With Rita now safe, the authorities began an investigation into her husband's death. They were marking out the area and any evidence they could find when a black bear lunged from the brush and tried to attack one of the troopers. But this trooper was armed, unlike Robert, and ended the bear's violence with a fast dose of lead pacification. With the bear now dead, questions began to fill their minds. Was this the same bear that had stalked and killed Robert, or could it be a second bear? Robert's corpse was placed in a cadaver pouch and flown to a coroner's office in Anchorage for an autopsy. The bear's carcass was driven to Fairbanks for a necropsy and analysis by the Alaska Department of Fish and Game. Authorities were most interested in determining if the bear that had returned to the scene was in fact the bear that had killed and partially consumed Robert Weaver. After analyzing the bear's carcass and measuring the distance between its teeth to compare to the wounds on Robert's corpse, state biologists arrived at a conclusion. They determined that the bear was a middle-aged male, likely between 10 and 20 years of age. It weighed 230 pounds and had ample body fat, so it was not starving. Examining it for illness revealed that it was not rabid or infected by any other disease. Apart from its molars being worn down, the bear had no significant health problems. During the analysis, the bear's stomach was opened up to examine its contents. Tissues from Robert's body were found inside, indicating this had indeed been the bear that ate Robert, but was it the bear that had killed him? The investigation included a survey of the immediate area, and it indicated that there were no other bears in the vicinity. 
Given the lack of other bears, the black bear that was shot after sneaking up on the troopers was deemed the bear that also killed and consumed Robert Weaver. Authorities were quick to point out that there are five key factors to avoid being attacked by a bear. They state that people should avoid surprising bears, approaching them, or feeding them. Campers should avoid pitching camp on or near a trail and avoid bear food caches. But this advice isn't absolute, as Mr. Weaver's relative points out in a public letter following their uncle's attack. Weaver's nephew or niece points out that the black bear had been run off by the Weavers once before leaping from brush to ambush Robert, so it clearly was not surprised by their presence. The Weavers were trying to avoid the bear and hadn't set food out for it, so the second and third of the five factors do not apply either. They were entering their cabin, so they hadn't encroached upon a bear trail or travel route. During their investigation, authorities found no food caches the bear could have been defending, and it was a male, so it was not protecting its cubs. After excluding any other possibilities, the black bear's actions were deemed strictly predatorial. Following watching her husband be killed and eaten, then having the bear try to gain access to her inside of the cabin, Rita was left with PTSD. She'll likely have to deal with lingering effects from this attack the rest of her life. Over the last 50 years, there have been only four fatal black bear maulings in the state of Alaska, averaging at about one every 10 years. There are estimated to be 100,000 black bears in Alaska. After reviewing the facts surrounding this episode, I'm left with a few questions for you. With a very high population of black bears in Alaska, are you surprised at the low rate of fatal maulings by them? Do you think the presence of brown bears caused black bears to be less predatory or territorial? Given this bear was healthy and didn't have a lot of competition, why did it suddenly decide to start predating on human beings? Do you plan to start teaching people you go into the woods with how to operate firearms and carry bear spray? I hope so. I'll be glad to read and respond to your thoughts, so please post them in the comments section below and let's talk about it. Welcome back to Scary Bear Attacks. Today's episode takes us to the border of the Chugach State Park, just east of Anchorage, Alaska. The town of Eagle River is the namesake city of the Eagle River that runs through it. The river starts about 30 miles from town in the peaks of the Chugach Mountains and creates a beautiful valley as it flows to the Kinnick Arm. This valley is filled with foliage and salmon when they run each season and is consequently a paradise for people and bears. About two miles before the Eagle River Nature Center is the last beacon of human development. It is a housing development that was built back in the 70s and overlooks the Eagle River Valley. The roads are carved into the hillside and hairpin as they climb the slope, dividing thick brush and trees. It may seem like a bastion of human triumph over nature, but the brown bears of the area seem to have missed the memo. This area is prime bear country and numbers are increasing, so much so that the line between human zones and bear zones overlap, leading to dangerous confrontations. As we've discussed in prior episodes, sows that raise their cubs in areas close to human development tend to be larger and have larger cubs that survive at higher rates than sows in more remote areas. Today's episode is another example illustrating this phenomenon. On the afternoon of July 22, 2012, 50-year-old Bob Eater decided to head up one of the trails outside of his home for some fresh air. Bob's partner in crime was his beagle, Lewis. Beagles are known for their keen sense of smell and are hunting dogs, though their short, stout legs seem to belie that ability. Now, normally Bob would pack bear spray whenever he went out for a walk, but this time he forgot it back at his house. He rarely packed a gun while he was outside, despite one of his neighbors packing one while he mowed his lawn. Lewis usually alerted him of the presence of any animals, especially squirrels. His sharp sense of smell was like an early warning system, and Bob trusted in it. A short distance up the trail, the bushes along it grow very tall by midsummer. Alders and Devil's Club grow so closely together that they choke out a lot of the sunlight and make navigation through the area difficult. At over six feet tall in places, their thick branches and leaves reduce visibility to only a few feet and envelop the trail. As Bob and Lewis hiked their way up the trail, Bob made noise and talked to himself out loud to make sure any animals in the area knew he was there. He was a long-time resident and knew the risks and dangers moose and bears pose to people when caught unaware. Bob and Lewis rounded a hairpin that climbed a bit in the trail. After the trail flattened out, the path parted a thick patch of brush, 
It was the kind of place where you couldn't see what was there until you couldn't avoid it. As Bob walked through the patch, he was terrified by the most foreboding sight he could possibly see. Bob saw not one, but four huge brown bear heads pop up above the brush and turn in his direction. This may have been okay if the bears were a few hundred yards away, but all four bears were only five feet from him. Bob's legs instantly went weak, but he knew he could not overreact to this situation. He spun on his heels and took a casual step away from the bears when he felt a disorienting blow to the back of his head. The swat from the sow sent Bob into a front flip, and he landed on his back. He could see the bear, now upside down from his sudden change in perspective. She pounced on Bob, and they tumbled several yards down the steep hillside. The bear seemed infuriated at the surprise appearance of the man, and bit and clawed him in a tornado of teeth and claws. Bob didn't feel any of the gashes she opened up in his flesh, partly due to her speed, but also due to the effects of adrenaline. She clawed and attacked him for only about 15 seconds and disappeared as suddenly as she had appeared. The cubs that were with her were probably about three years old and nearly grown, but didn't attack Bob. As soon as Bob gathered his senses, he sat up. The bear was nowhere to be found, but he didn't want to move until he was certain she was gone. Bob glanced down toward his left leg and could see an enormous gash that had been opened up, exposing his muscle and tearing away a large flap of flesh. His scalp on the back of his head was gashed, and he could feel his blood trickling down the back of his neck. There was a lot of pain in his shoulder and ribs. Bob peeked into the tears in his shirt and could see the perfect imprint of a massive bear paw on the left side of his chest. There were four enormous gashes about three inches long at the front of the bear paw-shaped bruise. Blood seeped from several round puncture wounds on his shoulder caused by the sow biting him during the attack. Bob knew that his wounds were serious, and he couldn't waste any time in getting to medical help. He pulled himself to his feet and tested his wounded leg to see if it would support his weight. It may have been bleeding profusely and looked terrible, but it worked. Looking at his cell phone, he realized he couldn't call for help and would have to get himself to a place where he could get reception. Before departing, Bob removed his shirt and tied it around the injury to his thigh. He wanted to make sure to close the gaping wound to keep it as clean as possible and slow the bleeding. Walking as much as he could and sliding on his rear where he had to, Bob made it several hundred yards down the slope while hoping and praying the sow was done with her business with him. A private driveway appeared in front of him and he knew he was getting closer to rescue. Checking his cell phone, he could see that he had service and he quickly dialed 911. About an hour after the attack, the sound of sirens filled the valley as the first responders searched for Bob's location. Without an address, they had resorted to taking directions provided by Bob as he directed the dispatcher to his location based on the sirens. After an initial assessment and aid, Bob was rushed back to a hospital in town. Pictures of Bob's wounds are graphic and wouldn't pass YouTube standards, so I've uploaded them on my Patreon account. If you would like to see them, you can access them from the link below this video. I warn you, they are graphic and terrifying as they show how large a single brown bear paw is and how much damage a single swat can do. After four days of intense medical attention, Bob regained consciousness. The staff there informed him they gave him ten units of blood to replace his own that he lost. They also reported that he was in such bad shape that his body temperature had dropped to just above 90 degrees, which happens just before death when a person bleeds out. Bob spent 12 days in the hospital and was on antibiotics for 20 days afterward. He walked out of the hospital on his own power upon his release. Working hard on rehabilitating his body, Bob recovered enough to run a half marathon only eight months after the attack. As for the sow and her cubs, authorities took no action against her. Bob's attack was defensive. She didn't kill him and consume him, so it was clear she did not have any predatory motives. Lewis was uninjured in the attack and accompanied Bob down the hill. The police officers took him to one of Bob's neighbors so they could take care of him. In response to Bob's attack, the Alaska Department of Fish and Game posted warning signs in the area and closed it to hikers. They stated that the sow was likely nowhere near the attack site, but giving her space would prevent another incident with her. After reviewing the facts surrounding this episode, I'm left with a few questions for you. Why didn't Lewis pick up the bear's scent and alert Bob? Would you have turned around after realizing you'd forgotten your bear spray or keep going with your hike? Do you think Bob would have survived if he'd been further from medical help? 
How would you feel if four massive brown bear heads popped up above the brush only five feet from you? I'll be glad to read and respond to your thoughts, so please post them in the comments section below, and let's talk about it. Thank you for watching Scary Bear Attacks. If you've enjoyed this episode, please consider clicking on the like button and clicking on the bell icon. We'll help you know when we post our new episodes. Posting our video links to your social media profiles furthers awareness, and it's fun. We slashed our prices in our merch store, linked below. So check out the bargains there while you shop. As a member of our human community, remember to adventure bravely and be careful out there, especially in bear country.